It, I must say it's very unusual to be here at a time which is normally my bedtime, but I must say it's really fun to be speaking to you all here in this very cool dome of visions and also people who are around the world and maybe even people 100 or 200 years in the future from the time capsule. And some of you may be surprised to hear at all that one can study language and communication at KTH. But in fact, our unit has been here for more than a quarter century, and we are here to stay. We are here, I'm going to tell you about tonight the work we do to ensure that KTH graduates and staff can communicate well in their first languages, in their second languages, for some in their third languages, in speech and in writing, with people within their field and with outside of their fields, and with people across the globe. And as I do so, we'll be looking a little bit at how our language teaching has evolved over the past 25 years. So we're celebrating our beautiful campus this week, and I thought I'd start off by showing you the four different homes for KTH language and communication. When we were part of chemical engineering, our offices were in Lilian Skogen, and then we were reorganized, and we moved to the top floor of the library's glass building there on the right. And then a second reorganization brought us to Lenzeswegen 24 as part of the School of Computer Science. And the third reorganization uh, to our current offices as part of the ECE school down here in the uh, bottom picture. And soon we'll be reorganized again. And all of you know at KTH know that this is happening. This sometimes causes some anxiety. So I'd just like to reassure, reassure all of you that what really matters is that our closest colleagues stay the same. So I have gathered some pictures here from what the team looked like in the different buildings here. This is about 20 years ago. And then we grew to look like this. And you'll see some, many of the same faces. This is where we looked at the computer science. And this is our most recent picture from the spring. So this is the gang that's responsible for teaching language and communication at KTH. And many of us stay for many years. We're happy working here. We like teaching languages to students. And we, we find that we often can make quite a difference in our students' lives. And now I'm going to tell you uh, four student stories of, who have studied language with us. This first man here is Raul Jimenez. He came to KTH from a small town in Spain as an Erasmus student to, to write his master's thesis. Uh, he ended up doing a PhD in peer-to-peer -peer systems, and he's still here in Stockholm uh, working for an American startup that does live streaming experiences like the one we're working with now. And I imagine that all Raoul's work now is in English, but when Raoul came to KTH, he could actually barely manage in English. He took three different courses in technical English with us, from the lowest level to the highest. And then when he was a PhD student, he took our course in writing scientific articles. And then one day out of the blue, I got a postcard from Raoul. He wrote, Dear Rebecca, I send this postcard from Kyoto where I just presented a paper. Thanks to you and your unit, I can write good papers and travel the world. Many thanks, Raoul. In our next picture, we see our director of studies, Bjorn Shelgrian, who is also our Chinese teacher. He's having a laugh with an old student of his named Jonathan Björk. Bjorn was in Chengdu, China last summer, walking down a street one summer evening when he heard someone calling his name, Bjorn, Bjorn, and he turned around, and there was Jonathan, whom he hadn't seen in many, many years. Jonah had taken, uh, he stu Jonathan studied computer science at KTH. He took a single elective course in Chinese language and culture from Bjorn. And then he went on to do a semester in Hong Kong that turned into two semesters. And that turned into a four-year job at one of Hong Kong's leading companies. And now he's a consultant on China in Britain. And he plans to open a company in China. He speaks both Cantonese and Mandarin. And they had a good time at this visit last summer. And Jonathan told him many times, told Bjorn many times, that that single elective course in Chinese had totally changed his life. This young woman is Anna Anstrom. Anna always knew she wanted to study languages. And she studied a lot of Spanish before she even thought about coming to KTH. She studied Spanish in Chile. She was working in some slums, and she decided that she wanted to go to KTH to learn how to build a better infrastructure so she could return 
to Latin America and help the many people who live in the slums of Latin America. So she studied Spanish with us at the highest level. She was already very good. And then finally we have here Anton. Anton is a chemist in Japan. You see him with the fruits of his studies here. Anton uh, took a couple of courses with us Japan in Japanese many years ago. And then he went off as one of the first in a long series of students to the prestigious Cato Laboratories at the University of Tokyo. And Anton says about his time there that KTH students were always particularly welcome at Kato Laboratories because they knew some Japanese when they arrived there. And that meant that the Japanese who were working there could see these uh, in external people not as stereotypical Swedes, but as real people because they knew some Japanese. Anton did a PhD in chemistry, and he now works at uh, Kanebo Cosmetics, a major field in the cosmetics uh, company in the cosmetics field, and he's one of only two Westerners in their whole headquarters. So he has a big role there. So I hope you find these examples interesting to see students can integrate languages with their studies at KTH, and that can change their lives. And it also shows you why we enjoy doing the work that we do here. Unfortunately, except for studies in Swedish, we're actually seeing far fewer students now than we did 20 years ago. Uh, this is partly due to un the university's own policies that I'll explain in a minute. But on this graph, I'm going to show you some numbers, first from 20 years ago about, then about 10 years ago, and then this current fall. And you see a scale up to 350 students here. So when I was studying teaching English in 1998, we saw almost 350 students in one fall semester. And 10 years later, that number had fallen to, bar, to only half. And this fall, currently, it's fallen a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And we see a similar picture for French and for German, Spanish as well. Communication, we have some required courses, so we have some nice numbers there. Those are courses in Swedish for Swedes, the communication, by the way. Um, so this makes us a little bit sad and unfortunate. We wonder, uh, well, I can, I'm going to explain you why it is now. Between 1998 and 2008, there was a, uh, many changes uh, in university policy. Throughout the 90s, there was a program called Technology, Mankind, and Society, where KTH students were required to broaden their education and take courses in economics or history or languages and so forth. And that program was abolished. And then another thing that happened was that the whole European education field was transformed by the Bologna process, where we have a three-year program and a two-year program, and each of those programs have less room in them for elective courses. So Students were constrained in that respect. And then finally, KTH was divided up into nine different schools, and there were many incentives for students to keep studying courses within their schools. So that's what happened in that era, those 10, year, ten years. And then in the most recent 10-year period, we've seen the imposition of a credit ceiling so that students are no longer uh, able to take extra courses. So now, rather than encouraging study students to study languages students are in fact many cases actively prohibited from taking language courses and we think this is a shame in an era where there's a lot of talk about internationalization we would like to be able to inspire more students fortunately internationalization is not only about moving abroad it's also about welcoming students to kth uh, most of the students who come here want to learn some swedish and i couldn't show the numbers for Swedish on the same graph as before because the scale is so enormously different. So if our pe previous graph went up to 350 students, this one goes up to 1,400. And uh, here you can see that uh, while we were losing the uh, students who wanted to study English and French and German or Spanish, we were actually doubling the number of students studying Swedish between 98 and 2008. Uh, and that, in fact, reflected a bit of a problematic imbalance for KTH. There were more students who wanted to come here and study with us than students who were traveling abroad. And that's been adjusted now, so we, has, we have about 600 students this fall studying credit-based courses in Swedish. And then in this last green bar, you see all the students who are studying any kind of Swedish with us, well over 1,000 students just this fall term. So who are all these students? 
Um, well, the university wants people to study Swedish. With all this foreign talent finding its way to Sweden, it would be a shame if some of them didn't want to make a life here. And our exchange students take regular Swedish courses, but the degree-seeking students don't have room in their programs to do so. So the university administration funds a super uh, free introductory course for master's students where we actually teach 600 students at a time. We fill KTH's biggest lecture hall to the brim with students uh, studying Swedish in a lecture-based format, and that's an unusual way to study language. Uh, but we have put our best pedagogical minds to work here. We have lots of activities outside of class for them to do and student assistance to get them practicing and so forth. So we're really pretty pleased with how that course is working out now. And um, we follow that up with some smaller courses for the really ambitious students who would like to uh, stay in Sweden after they graduate in professional Swedish. And then on the right here, you see a group of KTH staff and PhD students studying Swedish actually in the room right next to my office. A while back when KTH went to English language master's programs, there was a lot of talk about how staff would manage teaching in English. It would be so difficult for them. And that kind of discussion has kind of disappeared right now, and it's been replaced by a discussion of how are our staff going to teach in Swedish? Because so many of them are, are foreign, uh, have their education, their background from foreign countries. So most newly hired PhD students and staff now don't, don't speak Swedish. We advertise, of course, globally for the best staff. The working language of the departments is English, so the people can't rely on being in a Swedish-speaking environment to learn the language. They have to have classes, focused studies. You might wonder, does it matter that KTH staff speak Swedish if English is the working language at KTH? And of course they do. First of all, they need to be integrated in Swedish society to have a good life here. But KTH also needs them to speak Swedish because Swedish is the official language of KTH. It's government authority. We must do things in Swedish. Teaching at the bachelor's level must be in Swedish. And university leadership needs to be in Swedish. And I can tell you as an American who has lived in Sweden for over 30 years, it's very challenging to uh, teach in a second language, and leadership is even harder, I think. Uh, so most of the new staff do have Swedish not as a second language, that would be English for them, but as a third language. So you can imagine uh, how difficult it really is. It's a huge challenge, so these people need all the support they can get in studying Swedish. Okay. So now I've told you a little bit about how KTH language teachers can make a difference, and I've shown you how the balance of what we do has shifted in the past quarter century. And I'd like to finish by looking at how language teaching has evolved in the same time period. And here I'm thinking a little bit of the time capsule audience who, who might look back and think how interesting it was, how quaint it was the way they used to teach. So one thing, first, I want to say that hasn't changed is our pedagogical approach. I'd say it's always been interactive and constructivist, guide on the side. Our first language teacher had a fine education in applied linguistics, and she avoided creating courses with drills and memorization, which is the way languages were taught maybe more in the 50s and 60s. So our roles as teachers are to create good tasks for the students to do their learning in. But what has changed for us is the way we use technology. This is true, of course, for teachers everywhere. So now I'm going to show you three techniques that have pretty much disappeared between the time when I was learning language and communication and between the time I, I, I started teaching it. First of all uh, is the language lab. For a while, technology and language learning was synonymous with a language lab. And I spent time in labs like this. You'd go and you'd put on your microphone, uh, put on your headset and your microphone. You were in the numbered booth all alone, and you'd hear things in your ears, and you'd repeat it into the microphone. And somebody might be listening at any given time, but they might not be either. Most of the time, nobody was listening, and you were just talking to the microphone. So in the 70s, I practiced German this way so that valuable class time in my German classes would not be spent actually speaking the language to another person. Fortunately, labs like this no longer exist. They never did, in fact, at KTH, so we'll say goodbye to them. Uh, now students can listen to all the material they'd like to in the target language on their telephones. No, no limits there. 
And for speaking practice, we pair them up with partners in our tandem program so that they can trade language training with another person who wants to learn their language. And we make the most possible use of our digital course platforms as well to both distribute audio material and to collect uh, both uh, written material, of course, but also filmed material and spoken material from the students so we can work on our course platforms. And they help us deliver less costly teaching. Um, we do have two fully online courses. Students appreciate them quite a bit, that they don't have to come to the meeting. So that is a bit of the future there, too. Um, and, uh, well, we're, we're happy about that. All right, so then the, the next change I'd like to talk about is one that I don't regret either. Uh, this is an example of how I wrote my, all my academic work on the left, handwritten on legal pads. And then on the right is actually an actual copy of my bachelor's thesis from Yale in 1981. 1981 was actually the year the personal computer came on the market. In other words, it was too late for me. My education was complete at that point. Uh, so that was unfortunate. A large part of what we do at Language and Communication is teaching students how to write and speak as engineers or as researchers. And academic communication like this requires good input, it requires situated practice, and in, of course, constructive feedback. And digital technology has completely enabled us, particularly when it comes to writing. We take it for granted now that we can go back and improve a text, but we couldn't before. We had these, multi these written drafts, and then the typing process was costly, laborious, you know, tear your hair out, we hated it. So, so now we, yeah, you know, it's a huge step forward. It's a miracle that I learned to write it all when I think about how much I hated to type. Um, our students give each other peer feedback. Uh, on early drafts, we provide formative feedback on late drafts. We are able to treat writing as a process and not just a s simple product. It's labor intensive, but it's very, very worth it. So, goodbye to all of that. And then I'd li just like to talk about oral presentations as well. This is another academic genre that's developed in the last quarter century. Students make them all the time now, it seems. Swedes often think that Americans grow up practicing public speaking and. I have to say, I was never examined orally, not once, uh, in all of my 16 years of undergraduate education in the United States. The first time was when I was presenting my master's thesis at Stockholm University at age 35, English department. I had no idea how to rep prepare. I'd never even attended an event like that. So I took the written version of my thesis. I highlighted the first line or first sentence of every paragraph. I'm a good writer, so I had good topic sentences. And I read those topic sentences to the people in the rest of the room. That's how I did it. I had no idea. And the amazing thing is that within a year, I was actually teaching presentation skills at KTH. <laughs> I learned a lot very quickly. I had good mentors. Um, and I, I got very interested in the whole topic. Students find it very valuable to make presentations in their language classes, get feedback on what they do, be filmed and so forth. It was several years till I started using computers for my presentations, but my students were using them consistently throughout the 90s. For group presentations, we continued to use these overhead machines for a while, but now they're really disappearing, so we can say goodbye to them now. Um, as I said, I was very interested in how to make good oral presentations. And when I went to do a PhD in speech communication at KTH, I envisioned computer feedback for practicing oral presentations. And that was a dozen years ago, but now there are systems in production in labs across the world. So that lives on. Okay, so this um, brings me to the end of my talk. Those were a few of the ways where digital technology has changed how we teach and learn language and communication. I'd like to think back just a minute to those graduates moving all across the world into Sweden and outside of Sweden and think what more do they need besides language skills when they find themselves in a new environment. So uh, I, our, our, one of our newest efforts is called the Certificate of Global Competence. And students who spend part of their studies abroad and also take a couple of courses with us in intercultural competence, will be able to add this certificate to their degree certificate when they graduate to demonstrate to employers that they can work effectively uh, internationally. So thank you all for listening. 
We'll be continuing on our mission to ensure that KTH graduates and staff can communicate well in their first languages, second languages, third languages, in speech and writing, and with people from across the globe. Thank you very much.